irreverent, entertaining, cool. You're listening to LA Talk Radio. You're listening to Get Yourself the Job with Jennifer Hill, only on LA Talk Radio. Well, happy Monday, everybody, and happy belated Thanksgiving, hoping that everybody had a wonderful and safe Thanksgiving out there, where if you were in the United States and celebrating. And thank you so much for tuning in to Get Yourself the Job with Jennifer Hill. Before we jump into today's show, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, the people who make today's show possible, the folks over at Markham Search. Markham Search offers premier professional recruiting services to law firms and corporations throughout the United States. So a special thank you to our sponsor and to our guest today, Sharon Schweitzer. Sharon is a cross-cultural consultant, a business etiquette expert, and a best-selling and international award-winning author. Sharon has built a career around understanding cultural differences and the tremendous role that they play in building strong and successful international business relationships. With more than 20 years of practical business and legal experience, Sharon provides a depth of international business consulting and training services to highly motivated individuals, attorneys, and corporate executives in global corporations and law firms. Her work and travels have taken her to more than 85 countries on seven continents. She speaks French and some Czech and is certified to administer the GCI, Global Competencies Inventory, and the IES, which is Intercultural Effectiveness Scale, Intercultural Assessments. Her, uh, Sharon is also accredited in the Intercultural Management from the Hofstede Center in Finland, and she is author of the Amazon number one bestselling book in international business, Access to Asia, now in its third printing, and named to Kirkus Review's Best Books of 2015. She now lives with her husband in Austin. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sharon. Thank you, Jennifer. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, this is so great. So I love this subject. This this topic that we're going to be delving into today is this idea of emotional intelligence. So if you could tell our listeners a little bit about how this became something that you were passionate about and how you've come to speak in seven different continents or on seven different continents around the world about this topic. Well, emotional intelligence is crucial because our emotions impact our daily lives sometimes for better or worse. If we cannot gain an understanding of how to respond or react, we not only won't we succeed, but we're not going to be able to manage our relationships. So we need to face it, relationships, they weave the fabric of our lives. So having a sense of emotional intelligence and how to use it effectively is really important. Absolutely. And I think it's only in the last, I would say, about five to 10 years that it's become a popular topic among business leaders and also in the employment world. I think that for many years, we were so worried about people's Myers-Briggs profiles. I remember when I was starting off, I took a 40-page questionnaire to see whether or not your answers were valid. And I think that the shift has actually begun to happen in the last five years or so, where it's not just your intelligence quotient, but actually how you respond to emotions and situations. That's right, Jennifer. And you really touch on something that's very important. And I know your listeners are going to want to know because emotional intelligence, IQ, and personality are three different things. So Mm -hmm. emotional intelligence, it's an essential part of us as a whole person. So uh, let's talk about those three things, um, if we can, for a minute, because emotional intelligence, okay, great. Emotional intelligence taps into a fundamental element of human behavior, and it's distinct from our intellect. So there's really no known connection between IQ and emotional intelligence. We simply can't predict emotional intelligence based on how smart someone is or isn't. Intelligence is our ability to learn, and it's the same at age 15 as it is at the age of 50. Emotional intelligence, on the other hand, is a very flexible set of skills that can be acquired and can be improved with practice. So although some people are naturally more emotionally intelligent than others, 
we can still develop high emotional intelligence even if we're not born with it. Hmm. So personality, as you just mentioned, is the final piece of the puzzle. It's a stable style, if you will, that defines each of us. So personality is the result of some hardwired preferences such as our inclination toward introversion or extroversion. Um, However, like IQ, personality can't really be used to predict emotional intelligence. Also, like IQ, personality is somewhat stable over a lifetime, and it really doesn't change. So IQ, emotional intelligence, and personality, all three of them cover unique ground, but they all help explain what makes all of us tick. Hmm. So let's delve into that for a moment, because I think this is something I haven't quite heard somebody break it down in the way that you're breaking it down for everybody right now. So you have the emotional component. And if I'm hearing you correctly, is that something that's always evolving uh, and IQ and personality are fixed? Well, you can you can improve your emotional intelligence. OK, so let's talk about emotional intelligence for a minute. It's your ability to recognize and understand emotions in yourself and in others. And it's also your ability to use this awareness to manage your behavior and your relationships. So it's, it's the something in each of us that's intangible. It's a bit intangible and it impacts and it affects how we manage behavior, how we navigate uh, social complexities, how we make personal decisions that achieve positive results. So an easy, one way to look at it is, uh, the way I like to look at it is it's made up of four core skills. And you can kind of pair these four core skills up under two primary competencies. One is personal competence and the other is social competence. So under personal competence, We can look at it as self-awareness and self-management. Kind of, you know, it's kind of like people saying it's all about you. So you focus on yourself individually first before you focus on other people. So it's your personal confidence. How, what is your ability to stay aware of your own emotions and manage your own behavior and tendencies? So the two of the four are number one, self-awareness. What is your ability to accurately perceive your emotions and stay aware of them as they happen? So let's say this past weekend's a good example, Thanksgiving. A lot of us were with family. A lot of us were with, you know, people that maybe triggered emotions. Um, so before you, you know, personal competence, let's say last week. You know, you know you're going to be around people who maybe trigger some childhood <laughs> memories that maybe aren't so pleasant. Maybe there's some really good ones, but for most of us, there are some that aren't so good. So what is your ability to for self-awareness and then self-management? Number one is self-awareness. Do I know that, okay, I'm going to be around maybe a sibling who um, is extremely competitive or who can yank my chain or who has different political views than I am. That's number one, that's self-awareness. Knowing I'm going to be around this person. Number two is self-management. My ability to use my self-awareness of my emotions to stay flexible and positively direct my behavior. So number one, I have to be aware, okay, I'm going to be around them and I know what they do. And number two, my self-management. How am I going to handle the situation when I arrive Am I going to politely excuse myself from the conversation or am I going to count to 10? Am I going to be calm? Am I going to stay away from alcohol or am I going to self-medicate and then be really quiet and not say anything? You know, there's different ways for self-management, but you have to make the decision. How am I going to self-manage? So those are the two aspects of personal competence that make up self-awareness. Okay. And then tell me a little bit more about the social competence side. Okay. The social competence side is social awareness. And 
this is more the relationship management skills. And this is your ability to understand other people's moods, behavior, and motives in order to improve the quality of your relationship. So for a lot of us, we, a lot of us learn to do this early um, in life. You know, this is your social awareness and then relationship management. Social awareness is your ability to accurately pick up emotions in other people and understand what's going on. So you get home from school early in life and you, oh my gosh, mom's not in a good mood. Or you get home and you realize maybe dad or grandpa's not in a good mood. That's social awareness. You figure out "Mm, things aren't good. Or you get home and, oh my gosh, things are great. Things are going really well. Relationship management is your ability to use awareness of your emotions and somebody else's emotions to manage those interactions successfully. So maybe you get home, you realize things aren't going well. What are you going to do? You're going to go plop down with your cell phone? No, you're going to go do chores. Or you're going to go do something that you know will keep you out of trouble. So that's Mm. social competence. Not so picking a fight. So not picking a fight. So let's talk about how that might look in the workplace. Let's say that you have two personalities who maybe are in conflict with one another. What would be an example of something that somebody who was working on or developing their emotional intelligence or their emotional quotient could do if they found themselves activated by somebody in an office who, for example, was being condescending. This happens often. We've all seen the devil wears Prada, the person who might be degrading or demeaning or condescending. What would be a healthy, emotionally intelligent way to interact with that person? Do you allow them to walk all over you or do you speak up for yourself and risk run the risk of losing your job? What's the EQ way? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, if we're going to go with the devil wears Prada example... <laughs> In that example, Jennifer, I think most listeners would say um, they're probably going to start looking for another job because that's a pretty extreme situation um, there. Um, and in that type of situation, I think you have to preserve your um, your your self identity and and your your ability to just kind of have self survival there. But I think if you're in a situation where you have someone who's a supervisor or a manager who is dishing out that type of behavior, one of the best things you can do is develop a coach or mentor within the workplace and go to them and say, give me some feedback. Tell me, is this something that is normal? Does this person do this on a regular basis? How, what do you advise? How do I handle this kind of feedback? Because what you need is intelligence from other people in the workplace as to what mm. has happened prior to your arrival. Mm. That's interesting. And what well, if there is no precedent for it? What if it's somebody who's relatively new? What if you and this other individual are both equally new to the workplace? Well, I, then I think you have to make a decision. I will self-assess and decide, do I want to stay in this workplace? Is this a healthy environment for me? Um, Do I want to continue to work in this type of environment? And if you do, then that's your decision. And if you don't, then you probably want to start looking for a new position. Yeah, I think it's great advice because, you know, in the Devil Wears Prada example, I think that we all get pushed and triggered to our limits when you have somebody who is outright yelling, screaming, and just really going to that extent. I think it becomes very clear that this is an abusive relationship and it's time to move on. But I think sometimes the thing that can be tricky is the more subtle variations of that, where you might have somebody who's a passive aggressive jerk, or perhaps you have somebody who's a gossip or a narcissist. And though that might not be the in-your-face, yelling, demeaning person, it could perhaps be equally as harmful. And it's how do you navigate that? And is it worth your time and attention to continue to stay in that relationship? That's right. Because sometimes you have to sit down with that individual and ask, what are your expectations? Uh, What would you like to see me do differently? And sometimes that will work itself out. And sometimes it just won't. Sometimes you get someone who is just unpleasant and unhappy, and that is the way their life 
trajectory is and nothing you sit down and do is going to change that. So that is how they're going to react and work in the workplace, in the office. And then you need to make that decision. So there are enough workplaces uh, where that is not the case. But many times you find organizational culture. And I think that's why interviewing is so important to interview with and meet as many people as possible before you accept a job offer so that you can get a sense of what the culture is. And I think sites like Glassdoor are invaluable because it gives you a real sense of the culture of the organization before you accept an offer. Absolutely. And so tell me, aside from using things like Glassdoor and such, are there any other ways that you think from the first one, the personal way that we can um, increase our personal competencies to increase our own self-awareness? Are there any exercises that you would recommend? Yes. Um, I I do. Uh, I think emotional intelligence has a huge impact on professional uh, success. It's a very powerful way to focus energy. Uh, One of the things that surprised a lot of people was that emotional intelligence was tested alongside about 33 other important workplace skills, and it was found to be the strongest predictor of performance. Explaining, yes, it explained a full 58% of success in all types of jobs. So it's the foundation for a host of critical skills, empathy, um, uh, leadership, flexibility, uh, ability to handle ambiguity, almost everything you say and do each day. 90% of top performers are high in emotional intelligence. And on the flip side, 20, just 20% of bottom performers are high in emotional intelligence. So you can be a top performer without emotional intelligence, but your chances are really slim. Um, the other thing that's really interesting, Jennifer, is people with a high degree of emotional intelligence make more money, an average of 29 k more per year than people with a low degree of emotional intelligence. The link there is so direct that the estimate is every point increase in emotional intelligence adds up to about $1,300 in an annual salary. So in terms of, yes. So in terms of what people can do, number one, seeking self-awareness. And when we say that, what we mean is be honest with yourself about your strengths and weaknesses because it's crucial. So you may know, you know, like I have to be honest with myself. I know that I can be somewhat of a perfectionist. So I have to let projects go. I have to say, okay, you're going to proofread this three times. You're going to have somebody else proofread it and then let it go. I I can't let the book manuscript sit on my desk until (laughs) I proof it a hundred times. I just can't do that, Jennifer. And I know that about myself. So you have to know what your weaknesses are. Um, you know, you have to do you lose patience if team meetings get off track. Um, do your customer service skills need work? You know, sit down and really assess your areas for improvement and seek ways to improve that by either practicing patience, empathy, things like that. But really do a good self-assessment and develop key soft skills that are going to boost your performance. Um, the other thing is eliminating emotional interference. Okay, so tell me a little bit about what is um, eliminating emotional interference. What does that mean? Well, your listeners are going to want to know that studies reveal that our brains process an emotional reaction before we logically can react to a provocation. Now, once we react, it can take 20 minutes to recover from that emotional stimulus. So in other words, when a coworker does something and we react and we're really angry about it, it takes 20 minutes to calm down. So we need to learn to eliminate those kind of emotional interference. So before letting that reaction take place, we need to acknowledge stress and anxiety that we're feeling. In other words, yoga, meditation, work out. Um, go into the office in the morning, and I call it getting my game face on. I kind of learned this from my husband. He, he played basketball. 
And he'll just say, okay, it's the busiest time of the year. We're trying to close the year-end deals. And he'll just say, I'm going to get my game face on today. I'm not going to let anything upset me. And he'll go in and, you know, it could be falling down around him. And he'll just say, you know, just handle one crisis at a time. And it just stay steady because, you know, we're not doing, at least in my office and in his office, we're not doing brain surgery and we're not rocket scientists. So all we can do is handle one project at a time. And it really makes a difference because yes, you know, there's been a big mistake. We'll fix it. We'll apologize to the customer and we'll move on. Yeah, and I think that can't, Go ahead. Oh, you go right No, ahead. please, after you, Jennifer. I, I was just going to say, I know for me personally, I've noticed that it's if you can prevent yourself from sending that email or text or making that call, that was the trigger for me is that years ago before I started meditating or bringing self-awareness into the picture, it was you get so angry that you see red. I, I have this thing called the red mist where it would literally descend and I was like the Hulk and I couldn't even see straight. And thank God now I have the wherewithal to realize, hmm, this might not be the best state of consciousness to send this email or to make this phone call. And just in that moment of pausing and not doing it right in that moment, even not even going the full 20 minutes, even 20 seconds or two minutes, I've found makes the biggest difference in making choices that are more cognizant as opposed to reactive. That's exact, And that's exactly what this is about, eliminating the emotional interference. And you just nailed it. That's precisely it. Just give it some time. Yeah, one of my teachers recently taught me to do something called pause, what a pleasure. So in those moments, not only to pause and just, and that's half the battle for anybody out there who's going through an activating situation, a pause. And then this is the next step, which is even some might say a little bit more challenging to actually say or think out loud, what a pleasure, what a pleasure that this person is triggering me or activating me because there's something I'm going to learn about myself that's being reflected to me in this moment for a reason. Oh, I like that. I hadn't heard that before. I'm going to use that. Yeah, please take it. It's uh, one of my teachers and uh, mentors, David Kiem. He does. I love his stuff. He's been on the show before on, I think it was April 2nd of this year, if anybody wants to go back and find that episode. But pause, what a pleasure. You can pause and then say out loud, what a pleasure. And it just makes all the difference in the world. Because in that moment, when you say what a pleasure, you've just shifted your consciousness. And I w- I'm not a neuroscientist, but I'd be willing to bet that you may have just created a new neuron pathway that didn't exist. That makes complete sense because you're taking a negative and turning it into a positive by saying what a pleasure. Yeah, and, and it's not easy. Trust me. It was, uh, today it was like trigger, trigger, trigger. You and I were on the phone. You're like, oh, it's uh, it's on Thursday, Jen. And it was so funny because you and I, that's the thing. In that moment, I was like, oh, what a pleasure. You know, I could totally be frustrated or be upset. And I was like, no, this is great. This is a learning opportunity. What a pleasure that I had this opportunity not to be reactive in this moment. And how often we're confronted by moment after moment after moment of just confrontation or potential conflicts. And when you're when you see it, it's really this sense of victory that you have when you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't succumb to that reactive nature. And five or 10, 20 minutes later or three hours later, you might have a reactive moment, but acknowledging yourself and the courage it takes to not be reactive in that moment is another big thing. It's just saying, wow, you know what? I did pause what a pleasure once today. And I really want to acknowledge myself for that. Well, congratulations. You did a great job. And I know I was today, I was like, okay, this is like the, you know, fifth snowball sent my way today. And I thought, okay, totally. you're just catch it softly and you're going to handle this smoothly. <laughs> so, <laughs> I hope I was as gracious on the oh, phone as you, you were. Totally you were, were fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. It's just like, I find that we get confronted right when you're trying to get to the bottom of something, when you have a lesson, whenever I'm getting ready for a speech or a show, whatever that topic is, just gets put full force in your face and it's a mirror and you see it in the people around you. And that's why we often get so activated or frustrated about people in situations is there's something about that person or situation that odds are probably a hundred to one, if not more, that we've been in the reverse situation and we're just being given an opportunity to see, because I've been on that side. I've been totally reactive with people and like, oh, how could this happen? And it's just a moment to go, oh, okay, I have an opportunity to choose something different And my personal experience, Sharon, is that 
when we confront that lesson, whatever that lesson is that we failed time and time again, the moment we confront it, it disappears. That person, that situation, literally, um, I had heard the story recently about this woman who is annoying somebody else in her cubicle and was like, hi, I want to go to lunch. Let's go to lunch. And was complaining to everybody, oh, why is this person showing up in my life? This is so unfair. And then the moment she looked at her own life and with one of her mentors, like you said, I love what you said about finding other people in your office or other mentors that can help you see this for yourself. The moment somebody pointed out to her to look in her life and see where she was that person as somebody else, and she saw that her husband who worked at home, she did the same thing to him that this person who was annoying her did. That woman got transferred to another office. Oh. <laughs> Just as one example, it was a story I recently heard. Oh my gosh. It, sometimes it comes full circle. It, it really does. And in the interim, it's just not letting the person activate you for as long as they are in your life, whether it's a moment, a week, a year, or 10 or 20 years or a lifetime. You know, it's just an opportunity to grow constantly. Yes, it is. It really is. So tell me a little bit about, so we've talked about eliminating this emotional interference, giving yourself whether it's 20 seconds, 20 minutes to recover from an emotional stimuli. How do you evaluate something objectively? And then once you've gotten to that place, make sure that you're still not coming from a reactive place. All right. Whether we're dealing with a difficult client or we're kind of smarting after an offhand comment from a coworker, depersonalizing the situation is key for maintaining healthy relationships. We tend to assume that people act or speak in relation to us personally, when in reality, people do and say things that are more about themselves, not us. So it's really important for us to realize that we can't take things personally. So we need to strive to accept the fact that other people act and do things because it's about them. It's a reflection of them, and it's not about us. So we need to evaluate things objectively. Awesome. And then this ties into, I know it's one of the other steps that you highlight in your book and other trainings that you do, this concept of being proactive, not reactive. Tell me a little bit more about that. Okay. Jennifer, the reason this is important is because when issues arise, sometimes we tend to, to react. But if we can think about emotional intelligence in a proactive way, decide your next move based upon what will resolve the problem most effectively. If we take a reactionary approach by retaliating, going straight to the manager or just saying, forget it, you know, I'm just going to give up on this client or customer, it only creates more challenges down the line. Instead, a really good way to approach it is seek a solution that's going to address your colleague or your client's concerns and prevent future conflict. A lot of people think, oh, I'm not going to apologize. I really don't want to do that. But sometimes an apology demonstrates emotional intelligence skills of self-management, emotional intuition, and empathy. Say, you know, I really apologize that this has happened. What can we do to make it right? And people love to hear that, and they want you to make it right. And they many times they want to give you that opportunity. So yeah. being proactive really helps. I apologize. Did I cut you off? No, not at all. I was going to say, I love that. It reminds me of something somebody once taught me. Have you ever heard of the four Sufi gates to pass something through before you uh, speak words? Have you ever heard of this before? Oh, please educate me. Yeah, it's an old Sufi tradition that advises us to only speak after our words have managed to pass through the following four gates. At the first gate, we ask ourselves, are these words true? And if so, we let them pass on. And if not, they go back. The second gate is we ask, are they necessary? The third gate is, are they beneficial? And the fourth gate is, are they kind? And if the answer to any of these is no, then what you are about to say should be left unsaid. And that's a famous thing about the four Sufi gates. Well, that leads right into the, the final comment, which is acting with empathy which is really the greatest indicator of emotional intelligence. Because if 
the one of the gates is kindness and empathy plays right into that because empathy is our ability to understand someone else's feelings and perspective. So to have any kind of emotional intelligence, we need to be sensitive to emotional signals such as tone of voice, body language, eye contact, and understanding why our counterpart or the other person is feeling the way they're feeling. Um, then we can evaluate our course of action in relation to their viewpoint. Um, I think this plays right into the four gates and it yeah. allows us to provide the best service or the best response to whatever the situation may be. I love this. I love that it ties in perfectly because in any sort of life person or life situation, personally or professionally, I think if you follow these steps that you've highlighted, and I love looking at the personal competencies versus the social competencies, and then kind of going through each one of these as a practice or an exercise, you know, they say that the way to, you know, when we work out, we have to break something down in order to rebuild it. And the same is probably true of our emotional intelligence. We have to break down our old ways of thinking and our old perceptions in order to flex the muscle of our emotional intelligence. Yes, that's exactly right. But you do, you have to break it down into self-assessment, self-management, and then break it down into the social aspect of social management and social relationships. And then you can build it up. I love that. Well, we've gone through so much today, Sharon. Were there any other points or takeaways that you would love our listeners to walk away from today's show with? You know, the one thing I would say in closing, Jennifer, I think that your listeners probably realize that once you start learning about emotional intelligence and you start self-managing and managing relationships, you realize it's a journey. It's not a race. And the <laughs> holidays are an especially important time these relationships, they weave the fabric of our lives, and learning how to handle them intelligently is priceless, um, and it, it takes time, so we just have to be patient. I love that. Well, tell our listeners, please, where can they pick up your book? If they want to hire you as a consultant, where would they do so? Well, um, I have a website. It's SharonSchweitzer.com, and it's S H A R O N. S-C-H-W-E-I-T-Z-E-R. And my book is called Access to Asia. And it's available um, on Amazon, of course, and Barnes & Noble or anywhere fine books are sold. Wonderful, Sharon. Well, thank you so much for all of these insights. I have a page of notes here in front of me from all the great tips and tidbits that you gave to our listeners today. So I definitely got a lot of takeaways for myself and intending that everybody out there got one or more things of value today as well. And uh, again, if you missed any portion of today's show, just a reminder that the show is available for download after the show on the LA Talk Radio website under the Get Yourself the Job page. At the bottom in the archive section, this show or any prior shows that we've done can be found there for download. Additionally, if you prefer iTunes, if you happen to have a smartphone or iTunes account, you can go to Get Yourself the Job on iTunes and download any of our prior shows. And this show will be avail available a little bit later in the week. And so you can listen to those at your leisure. And I'd just like to say thank you again. It was such a pleasure to have you on the show. And uh, thank you for all the wonderful insights about our emotional quotient. Thank you, Jennifer. It's always a pleasure to be a guest on your show, and I hope to be able to do so again in the future. Wonderful, Sharon. Well, thank you again for joining us, and a very happy holiday season to everybody out there. Happy holidays. Listening to Get Yourself the Job with Jennifer Hill only on LA Talk Radio. 